In a recent video, Jessica Robinson, a former European and national champion, announced that she was quitting the game. And she also went on to list a few of the problems within the game that she is considering to quit because of. She talked about game design, she talked about pricing, she talked overall about the fact that Konami doesn't care about the player base, which is fair to some extent. I think it's obvious that the game is not perfect at the moment and never was, but maybe there's a way or a chance for us to brainstorm together and think of some ideas that can actually move the game forward in a positive way. So in order to do that, we're gonna talk about Yu-Gi-Oh through three different lenses. One is time rules, two is pricing, and three is game design. Basically, every single point that Jess has made. Just also talked a little bit about competitive integrity and skill, but we also covered that in our latest podcast of Table Zero, so check that out after you watch this video. And now before we start, make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel for more content like this, and we'll start with the most pressing matter, it's time rules. So a recent point of contention was that time rules in Yu-Gi-Oh are kind of busted. It's been like that for years. Basically, when the time is called at the end of a round when a game is tied, the player who has the most life points wins. And by slow playing and manipulating the game state or just using insane time cards like Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood, which saw a lot of play in the recent European Championship, players can just win without actually playing the game. Just gain a bunch of life points and time is called, you win. Now in other games, that doesn't necessarily work exactly like that. And throughout this video, we're going to be comparing Yu-Gi-Oh! to other card games that are more prevalent right now. And that, again, like in just this video, a lot of pros are migrating to. Quote unquote. So, Magic the Gathering, you get five extra turns and the most life wins. In the Pokemon DCG, it's a little bit more complicated. The player controlling basically in very simple terms the strongest Pokemon on the field wins. If that can't be applied, it's the influence of that player, which means that the player who has more cards in play wins. And if that can be applied, it's just counting the cards in the main deck. Lorcana, which is a game that is relatively new and a lot of people from Yu-Gi-Oh! are migrating to recently, has a mechanic called lore, which every card can gain you. You need to gain an overall 20 lore through different effects and creatures. And again, at time when you are closest to 20 lore, you win the game. So it's kind of the opposite of Yu-Gi-Oh! And in One Piece TCG, the player with the highest number of life cards, so again, kind of similar to how Yu-Gi-Oh! works. And then if that can be applied, they also count the number of cards in decks, the characters on the field, and the player who last drew from their life deck. So you can see a common pattern here, which life actually does matter in other games as well. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! is just the end of the current phase. Which means that you can play a very long combo into time and then throughout that combo gain life or burn your opponent for a little bit of damage and that's enough to win. So I think there's a few solutions here. I think in every one of those scenarios you need to be gaining extra turns. I think the fact that the end of the current phase is the current time rules for Yu-Gi-Oh! makes it a lot cheesier. Sure, games are going to take a little bit longer, but the competitive integrity of the game will be withheld. So, for example, you take three turns, starting from turn zero, when the time runs out. And, for example, the first player to inflict battle damage can be declared the winner. So, you have a little bit of time to set up, you can build a board, you can build a defense, and then you can plan your attack in battle. Which is, of course, much more similar to the manga and the anime. And that could be cool because a lot of times game 3 begins and ends on turn 1 where the player doesn't have a battle phase. So they're gonna have to come up with a defensive strategy rather than just burning in time. And another method could also be cards in deck. Which means that for the next 3 turns you're gonna have to play a little bit more conservatively. But overall, regardless of those two solutions, I think at least giving three more turns to play or even within the current time rules will allow both players to play. Again, I think the biggest problem is that game three begins and ends on player one's turn, which means the other player doesn't get a chance to even play. And that seems a little bit unfair. So I think we can gather that other games give extra turns. I think even though it will obviously take tournaments longer 
and rounds will carry on more into time, it will still be a lot more fair to win or lose in time. Now the second and one of the biggest ones is prizing. Even though a lot of players are conflicted, a lot of players say, I'm gonna keep playing regardless of the prizing. And again, this game existed for 25 years up until this discussion. So people have been playing it without any real prizing. So just to make sure you're aware of the prizing in Yu-Gi-Oh, the most common championship series is called a YCS, a Yu-Gi-Oh championship series. There's about like 10 or 12 of these a year. It's a big, big regional championship with around 500 to maybe 2000 players for each one of them. So it's a big tournament. Now for winning a YCS, you will get a ultra rare prize card. You will get a Nintendo Switch, flight, and accommodation, and a VIP status for the next YCS, which honestly is really good on its own. You get a branded messenger bag with the YCS logo, maybe some packs, and that's it. Now for Top Cut, the top players will get a Nintendo Switch as well, but everybody will get a super rare version of the same prize card as first place, which is honestly a little bit shameful. They will also get a playmat and some packs as well. So that's it. It doesn't sound like a lot. It's worth around maybe $400, $500, excluding first place, which is worth a lot more. So it's not that bad. And actually it's quite similar to Lorcana and One Piece TCG. In One Piece, it's only promos, prize cards, and sleeves. They're just actually more valuable in the marketplace. So people pay more for them so you can actually sell them for a bigger price. And we'll touch on that when we talk about the solution to Yu-Gi-Oh's prize card problem. The promos are playable meta cards, there's a lot of them, and some of them are also stamped with the logo of the championship series and first, second, or third place for the top three, which is extremely cool and makes the promo and the prize card unique to that event. And of course, since the cards are playable, you can replace them with your own cards and get some status points and look very, very cool doing that. They also have packs for participation, top cut, and finalists in which you can pull more prize cards. So again, think about getting to top cut and then having like eight or 10 prize cards available within booster pack, which is an extra reward on top of your reward. And then it's a matter of chance, which makes them a lot more exclusive as well. And again, it's about the market in general. So a playable card, even though it's a reprint prize card, will obviously sell more than a vanilla Another vs. Dragon. Now, Lorcana is probably the closest to Yu-Gi-Oh! at the moment. There's a bunch of prize cards for Top Cut. Again, playable cards in a different prize card form, similar to what One Piece does, and rubber playmats. That is it. So I'm not really seeing the appeal of why people are moving to Lorcana for basically the same prizes. And the game is not cheap as well. And Magic the Gathering and Pokemon TCG actually have prize money, which I think in my opinion might attract the wrong people to the game. I don't wanna be playing for $10,000 in a final, to be honest. It's much more wholesome when the prizes are actually tied into the game. If you wanna make money, go play poker. So how can we fix the prizing problem? Of course, we can just offer $100,000 for first place in the YCS. That would be very easy, but I think cash prizes are off the table for this discussion. But I do like One Piece's direction. You take playable meta cards from the current format. So for example, there's a YCS pretty much for each set or expansion in Yu-Gi-Oh. You take a bunch of the meta cards, you reprint them in a new exclusive rarity or an alternate art, and you can also stamp the YCS logo on it with Top Cut or Champion even printed on top of them. That way, throughout a season, competitors can collect the prize cards for the meta cards in their meta decks. So think about it right now, people will be scrambling for three Fiendsmith Engraver prize cards. It doesn't have to be an entirely new card like Crush Card Virus was, but an alternate version of an existing powerful card to also signify the time in which the tournament took place in. And I think if you have those exclusive rarities, exclusive packs for top cuts and finalists, and relevant meta cards reprinted as prize cards, it'll be much more attractive and people will actually pay big money for them. Imagine this year with another vs. Glutonia, which is the current prize card. Do you know how many super rare prize cards of another vs. Glutonia are out there? And the card is not even playable, so there's no reason to buy it. And if you do want to buy it, it's probably like $100 or $200. You want a prize card that will be relevant, maybe even playable, fun to collect, relevant to the format, but also sellable, so people can sell it and make their money or keep it in their deck and get some style points. And also you can do the whole playmat thing that Pokemon does. Pokemon does in fact have playmats, but they are marked as champion playmats. We actually have those for OTS championships. 
So imagine you can have different types of playmats for different types of placing within the top cut and an exclusive champion playmat. It doesn't make sense that the first place and the 64th place in a championship or a YCS get the exact same playmat. And again, there's only like 10 of these a year, so Konami, you could make a little bit more effort and make the pricing unique. Now for the last problem, the card design problem, which I'm probably the least qualified to judge on, but I will definitely try. First of all, I think beyond everything, Konami's presence in the West, in Europe, North America, South America, and Oceania need to start committing to a forbidden limited list date. That is obvious, that is basic, the OCG has that, but we somehow don't. This removes a lot of good potential value from the game. It means that people don't know when to buy or sell cards, they don't know whether to commit to sets or tournaments, and we know that it's possible because Konami did that just now when announcing there will be a ban list in August. So even committing to a time frame would be better than this. It's not a card design issue, but it's just a policy and company issue. And the other thing is just the philosophy of car design in general. I'll start with what I think the main issue is this year specifically. I haven't been playing for 25 years. I took a long break in between. So I didn't miss a lot of the new mechanics and new stuff that probably would have killed Yu-Gi-Oh back in the day. But I think now there's a bit of a more focused specific problem. Konami is moving towards smaller, more efficient and more powerful engines. For example, Snake Eyes. The best example because it's the best deck for a long time. Very, very small engine with a powerful one card combo in normal summoning or special summoning Snake Eye Ash that generates a ton of advantage, resources, interruptions, and follow-up. The card does everything. And the engine itself has extenders, but those extenders are also starters. So what Snake Eye Ash can do if it gets stopped, Bonfire can do. And if that gets stopped, Wanted or Dia Bellstar can do the exact same thing. It doesn't make sense that the engine is comprised of hyper consistent starters and extenders all in the same cards. And to add insult to injury, you actually need to run a very small card count for the engine and the rest will be filled with hand traps. Another example is the Fiendsmith engine, which has very easy access through the extra deck with Moon of the Closed Heaven. And decks with that engine just become extremely hyper consistent. And it's not only Snake Eyes. You can think of decks like Tenpai Dragon, Math Mech, Infer Noble Knight, Super Heavy Samurai, and even going back to Sword Soul, there's the one card combo that does everything. And all of which in very small efficient engines and the rest of the deck just fell to the brim with non-engine. What that creates is making the deck unbalanced. Half of the deck are cards that when resolving basically win you the game on the spot. And the other half of the deck is just cards that are meant to stop your opponent from doing the same thing. So what do games look like in 2024? Either an FTK or a hand trap war. And that is it. That's not creative gameplay and that's not creative card design. It also doesn't really leave a lot of room for deck building because you need to fill every single spot you have with just generic non-engine. Decks like Branded Espia, Rescue Ace, Ritual Beast, Labyrinth, and even Runic Variants have a very big engine. They rely on a very small but impactful set of board breakers and have many different pieces that when they resolve, generate a small amount of advantage. That way you can build an advantage over time and not just one card resolving wins you the game. So you have to deck build properly, you have to consider your engine count properly, and it's not just three copies of every card. It promotes creative deck building and gameplay and winning through engine and not just generic hand traps. And I think that's all of my opinions. These may be highly copious, but I would really like to hear your thoughts in the comments below. I hope this video was informative and again I really want to hear your thoughts on what you think are the real problems and maybe if some solutions to those problems came up in this video. Thank you so much for watching, please keep playing Yu-Gi-Oh! We love this game, we don't need money to compete and hopefully Konami listens and I think they are recently, hopefully it gets a lot better. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you in the next one, peace.